Welcome to episode 60 of the Empowering Ability Podcast. You are listening to the Empowering Ability Podcast and making expectations for what is possible for people with developmental disabilities. Here is your host, my brother, Elba. Hey friends, welcome back for yet another episode of the Empowering Ability Podcast. This week we have guest Libby Ells joining us on the show. And Libby Libby is a a sibling. Uh, Her her brother Matthew, um, older brother Matthew, has a disability. And she is also the founder of an organization called In Charge, which is a consulting organization in Western Australia that is assisting people with disabilities to be the authors and champions of their own lives. And I love that because really that's what we're all about here uh, at Empowering Ability. So um, it's been an honor getting to know Libby over the last several months here and she's walked you know many steps with her brother Matthew and her family and for 20 years she's assisted others to take front stage in their own lives. Um, She supports people through their experiences, lessons, successes and failures in self-direction over an extended period of time. Uh, Libby's vision is to bring a personalized heart understanding of what it takes to be in charge Um, And she currently lives in Sydney, Australia with her husband, Sebastian. So in this episode, Libby and I cover a broad spectrum of topics. Um, However, Libby goes into, starts out by going into her story and shares the story of um, the separation of Matthew, her older brother from her family and the impact that that had on her and it has had on Matthew, and she shares their journey of um, creating a good life for Matthew and the lessons learned along the way and the lessons that Libby has learned in supporting many other families and people with intellectual and developmental disabilities to take charge of their life. So uh, without any further ado, let's welcome Libby Ellis. Hey, Libby. Welcome to the Empowering Ability podcast. It's uh, a pleasure to have you on today. Hi, Eric. It's really fantastic to be here. So thank you for inviting me. My pleasure. And it's always a pleasure to talk to another sibling um, and excited to talk to um, a sibling um, from Australia. So across the other side of the globe here. And um, Libby, I think maybe just a good place to start would be to give listeners, other families, maybe um, supporters, self-advocates, a bit of context about um, who you are and just a little bit, um, and and I guess, you know, to share your story um, as a sibling. Um, So uh, maybe I'll just hand hand the mic over to you here and um, if you could just tell us who you are and, and, um, and, uh, you know, introduce us to your story. Yeah, no problems, Eric. And it was uh, actually, uh, just quickly, it was great to meet you in, in Toronto uh, when I was over there in the uh, in the wintertime in December, was it, that we met? Uh, December I, last year. I yeah. can't remember the date, but With yeah, it was, was a pleasure. And um, yeah, through Janet Cleese and... Um, Listeners to the podcast are pretty familiar with with Janet. I speak a lot of her, and uh, and she's been on yeah. it. So, so yeah. So that yeah. was cool, and uh, yeah, it doesn't surprise me meeting another fantastic person through Janet Cleese. So, yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah. So um, I live in I live in Sydney, in Sydney, Australia, and. Pretty much live here all my life. Although uh, my family, my uh, we were my whole family, my whole immediate family was uh, born in England, and we uh, immigrated to Australia, which is a story in itself. I might I might get to tell that because um, uh, it's it's parts of it are quite important. Um, but I have two brothers, a younger brother James. Uh, is married and has kids and lives in uh, Sydney as well. 
and my older brother Matthew, who also lives in Sydney, and it's my older brother Matthew who uh, has a, has a disability. I'm uh, married to Sebastian, and Sebastian is Canadian as well, and so that's what um, that's what regularly takes us back to Canada to to visit family and friends. So just to perhaps talk a little bit about my experience as a sibling and and uh, growing up, I re- reflecting on growing up, I think there was always uh, a thread in me that was about social uh, and environmental justice or injustice. Um, but I do. Actually, it was Bruce Uditsky's, um, there's been a lot of Canadians that have been influential in my life, Bruce Uditsky being one of them. Um, in his words, he talked about families being transformed um, by love and also through witnessing the experiences of their family members with disability. And certainly I think this has been the case for me of being transformed by love and also witnessing Matthew's um, experiences in a disabling world, Uh, experiencing the pain of his separation from us for many years, Uh, his seeing his uh, really extreme vulnerability uh, and unfortunately uh, uh, abuse in institutional settings his powerlessness and also the the impacts of of lack of any real control or authority that we had uh, when he was living in those situations. And, um, and so these these um, experiences have been yeah yeah. Just a question around that. How how old do you either maybe you know how old you were or maybe you could kind of ballpark it. So how old were you when you first started to realize that, realize those injustices for your brother, Matthew? Yeah, I think I was probably, uh, I remember, you know, kind of mid to to late teens, really um, sort of starting to form uh, some thoughts about it. But certainly there were experiences earlier than that that I guess as a child we lived or I lived with that kind of later really wondered, yeah, really started to put some some thought around around that. Um, But that would have been combined with, yeah, there's a mix in there because I was, I was as a young person, you know, that was the time around the time of the end of apartheid, you know, Nelson Mandela coming out of prison. I remember all of these things were really uh, thinking about uh, climate change, even, if, you know, well, climate change has been talked about for a long time. So this kind of rights-based perspective, I think, was in me and Matthew's experience was certainly part of the kind of triggering of that um, into something into something bigger. Okay, great. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of get context around when this started from you. So sorry, I interrupted you. You can continue back on that that thread um, of your story. No, that's fine. It's an interesting question because you know, certainly Matthew had some really painful and negative experiences uh, when he lived in the institutional care. And my memories of those are watching, really watching my parents, you know, well, just experiencing it. But then it's a good question about kind of when do you start to think this is not right um, or this is strange or, yeah. So probably as a child I would have had a, I think as a child I would have had a, yeah, there's a kind of a physical and emotional reaction and then later there's a, a, an understanding that has more of a, a political context, you know, political explanation that goes that goes with it. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. So, as a young teen, was this around the time that your brother was either entering or in institutional care or institutional living? If yeah, no, it was. 
institutional care is the right, right terminology. Yeah, it is the right terminology. Um, actually, it was younger than that, Eric. So uh, Matthew moved, Matthew, um, so all of that time growing up, Matthew moved out of a family home when he was nine and he lived in, um, he lived in a kind of medium-sized institution. I, I call it an institution. I think there were about 15 other people who lived there. And then um, that uh, kind of got broken up into group homes. Uh, and so then he lived in a group home. Um, I'm not sure how long for, but I do know that he, we eventually helped him move out of a group home and he was 26. So he lived a long time in, in institutional care. And my childhood my childhood experience of him is one of separation. This is a really important experience. This is, um, um, this is, yeah, I guess one of the important experiences of my life and his life is that experience of separation from us and why that happened, why it had to be that way when my parents asked for help that was the solution. Uh, unfortunately, we still meet families today where this is being proposed as the solution um, to uh, needing some some kind of assistance uh, to help my brother have a good life and to care for him um, and to keep him in in his family and in his community. Mm. So my childhood was basically we would see him on weekends and we would see him for. Uh, holidays yeah yeah so your brother was nine how old were you at that point so I would have been seven and then my younger brother was five okay so you're seven your brother um at the advice of others um and influence of others moves into an institution separated from the family Mm -hmm. how did that separation um you said that was really kind of a an important piece for for your life and your experience can you share how that impacted you or or how you think about how that has impacted you well i think that has well i I started to ask why eventually. I mean, Matthew went to a special school. He went to a separate school. He lived in a separate home. Uh, and um, or, uh, my, my, my whole family, really, we, we had this moment, I guess, when my, my younger brother, um, I remember, so there, there is a story where my younger brother was um, learning to drive. So he would have been, maybe 16 or 17, I can't remember. And so as practice, he would often say, I'd like to, you know, take Matthew back home. At the end of the weekend, I'll take Matthew back home to the group home. And I remember him coming home in tears one day and saying to mum and I and to dad, you know, I have to drop, I often have to drop Matthew off and I drop him off with a stranger and I don't know the person that I'm handing him over to. and. So it was around this time and so I would have been like 19, maths would have been in his early 20s. So it was really around this time that I remember we sort of had this collective um, questioning start start to happen and a a why and so people's, um, yeah, and that's led me, that's really led me on a, uh, on the on the path, you know, the rest of my life and career really to to date. So, I mean, when I think about that, those that kind of witnessing of my brother's experience, and the starting to ask the question of well, why and and what do we do about that, it really takes me to a number of lessons, I guess, I, that have been so important um, in my work because I've also worked. Uh, with people with disabilities and families, pretty much all of my my working life, um, so twenty five years or so. Yeah. yeah, and I'm excited to yeah. to 
dive into those lessons. Um, but before we do, so maybe we can just kind of put, put a bit of a bookmark there for a minute and come back to it. Um, I'm curious around, uh, has Matthew shared, um, if he has um, been able to, shared his experience his like you so you kind of shared your experience and your younger brother's experience uh around that separation what about from matthew's perspective has he been able to articulate that that separation experience for him or the institutional living experience for him or and maybe if not you know from your observation um what was that experience like for him Yeah, that's a really good question, Eric. And unfortunately, no. So Matthew doesn't speak. Uh, Matthew has quite a significant intellectual disability uh, and autism. He doesn't speak and uh, we haven't yet kind of found. So Matthew definitely communicates. But when I think about communication systems or assistive technology, those kinds of things, facilitated communication, we haven't yet found um, a a system that that really w- works. Or so what we know about what we know about Matthew is that he absolutely communicates. He has a lot of um, he has a lot of actually quite a depthful receptive language um, understanding. So that's like when you speak with math and to math, there's a lot that he will take in and understand. But what he's missing is expressive language um, and a difficulty in, in us and in our support system and in him as well in kind of learning, learning a consistent system um, like sign language or other ways to, to express his, his thoughts and his feelings. So when I answer that question, Eric, um, I've got two answers to that. One is that I have to think about his experiences and I have, you know, I'm communicating them to you from my perspective. So one is that I do know that Matthew experienced some not very nice things in those settings. Um, and, uh, you know, a couple that I'm prepared to talk about uh, he's like he's still got behaviors that we believe he learned at that time that were coping amazing coping mechanisms for him but they've turned out to really not be very helpful for him for his um, in terms of his his image and his reputation and his health his ongoing health mm-hmm. so um, he so, and when I look at pictures from him at that time and look, when I look at pictures of him now, um, there's just such a difference and it's not a difference of age. Um, uh, I could really see the impact of him, of, a, of the disabling environment he was in um, uh, compared to now. So the second part of my answer to that question is that when we were thinking about Matthew um, starting that questioning of why and starting that, that what else could there be, we need to do something about this, this isn't right, and that eventually led to Matthew moving out of a group home and into his own home, we had to, because Matthew couldn't articulate those things himself, we had to sort of almost like a a decision-making process that had to think about his experiences, that had to think about um, we almost had to take a leap of faith really and and so one of the, the... one of the really important experiences of that time and has been true in my work with families across my career is that exposure to meeting with other people, other peers, other leaders, 
people who have gone before you and have done things that you can't quite see, can't quite imagine could be possible, but then you meet people and they've made them possible and then you've got a kind of hunger for you can see the thing that you want because somebody else has created it and is living it. This is so important. So thinking about how life could be, how life should be, it's so important to meet other people, other leaders who have built, who have created that picture, that vision, you've had that vision and then gone about it and created it. Mm. So this was really, this was really important in those years and it was really my, it was really my mother Judith and her networks, a lot of whom are North American and Canadian people who are, were ground other families, other people with disability who I considered to be leaders in the, the inclusion movement, people like Jeff Strolley in North America, Bruce Uditsky, yeah, Janet Cleese eventually, lots of Australians, yeah, really, really important. Mm-hmm. That's, I completely agree with you, and that's a really um, important point that you're you're sharing, Libby. And I, I just really want to acknowledge your leadership and your openness and vulnerability to sharing your stories, because what we're doing right now in you know providing this platform or this um, medium for you to share your stories is giving other families access to someone else that went before them to someone else that's, you know, maybe and has some similar characteristics to, to your family. And they see, Oh, you know, well, that person moved out of a group home and and now has their own house or that Mm -hmm. person moved out of an institution or, you know, that other family supported them to do that. And they are, their loved ones nonverbal right and maybe they didn't have all the right answers or they didn't know what exactly all the preferences were but they took a leap in faith, of faith and did it right so you know there's i think that's it's so applicable to so many other families and it's just a different medium and maybe that opens the mindsets of, of other families just in you sharing your story so i think there's a lot of a lot of power in that libby um the- yeah, thank you, Eric. There is a lot of power. Um, there is a lot of power. When Matthew when Matthew moved into his own home, so this is this idea of um, a leap of faith. Like you've you've the evident the evidence that life will be better is there, but but it's not in your it's not in your family member or in your home. But when you look out to other people's lives, to what is right, to how other people without disabilities live their life and what's, um, you know, what's a good life in in general, these are the indicators that we have to work on, um, even though those indicators aren't in your your family. And uh, this decision was absolutely the right decision. There was a moment... um, when Matthew moved into his his own home, and I remember helping him um, in the bathroom one day. I can't remember whether it was morning or evening, um, but I was helping him clean his teeth, and I'll never forget it. He looked in the mirror. He was looking at himself in the mirror, and he smart. He was smiling at himself, and I had never seen this before. This was this is absolutely foundational moment and I was thinking wow Matt's looking at himself he's loving what he sees he feels pride um so this is the same Matthew this is Matthew who is has a disability who doesn't speak who has autism who has a lot of um behaviors and things that challenge him and others in his life and he really digs himself (laughs) um this is this. I'll, well, I think we're going to get to this. This discussion about shame and pride. Um, so, this experience of changing the environment, changing the role, changing your place in society is 
is generates has generated for Matthew. Uh, I really like myself. I like who I am. I like who I am in the world. This is. I knew then that we absolutely made the right decision. Yeah. Wow. What a shift, right? And but I want to move yeah. forward. But there's one. There's one question that's sitting on my mind, and um, I I feel really compelled to ask it. So I'm going to. I think a commonality that I see or I can sense from families that have a family member that either it it could be either or, or both. So it could be they're nonverbal and they uh, don't have the, a way of communicating or it's not, you know, um, maybe as clearly defined as, as others. Um, so that kind of communication being challenges with communication being one piece and then challenges with behaviors being another and those being barriers or roadblocks to families um, uh, moving forward with helping their loved one to get their own house or apartment or um, to develop that role in community um, or it could be the combination of communication and behaviors being the the, the blocker or that mental blocker. Um, Can you speak to your experience or your family's experience in um, breaking through that? In some ways, that's an ongoing challenge, although it's less of much less of a challenge than it was. So, yes, absolutely. There at the time, there was so much feeling about, you know, who's going to want to do this? Who's going to want to live with Matthew? Who's, how is he going to be able to, um, yeah, who's going to help him? Who's going to care for him? What if I call them the what if? So in my uh, work that I do with families as we're thinking through this working, sitting in this space of, you know, I really want this to happen, but I don't know if it can happen. Um, we go through a whole process that I call the what-if process together, and those what-ifs are absolutely fantastic. If we list them all out, um, and I find the mums especially (laughs) have fantastic what-if lists, Um, you know, what if somebody somebody does something to him? What if an accident happens? What if he loses the key? What if we, you know, there's there's so many what-ifs. If we list them out, they actually make the the perfect base of the safeguarding process that we need to, the system that needs to be built, the safeguarding system around a person that needs to be built. Um, So that would be, you know, kind of the second part of my answer is that we needed to work with, with, um, with others to really build, feel confident in the, 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 system that we needed to build to support my brother in his own home so in the end it's a a leap of faith that you need to take it's a step into it you need to step into the unknown Um, but prior to that there's a lot of work in kind of planning and thinking and preparing but of course you haven't you know and then perhaps starting to enact also in my work with families we do kind of small we can do a bunch of things in preparation like actual practical things but it's not until the person really moves and that I haven't been able to find any other way of describing it than the move, the physical move from the group home the first day, you know, in his own home is a, is a leap of faith. But there's sort of lots of things that can be put in place around that. And then you move, you move when, I guess, when you feel that you trust that enough or there's something inside you that says, okay, now's the time, we've got to do it or, or, or whatever. The other thing is that. Uh, particularly since the introduction of the National Disability Insurance Scheme in Australia, lots of lots of more people now have kind of paid supporters in their life, and there's families who are involved in recruitment of those people. And 
So when I th- used to, when I think, oh, who's going to live with Matthew? Who's going to want to care for the care for him? Well, as people who step forward, we f- we find the paid supporters uh, in in Matthew's life, and in much the same way, uh, we have found again by trusting, by uh, but having a really good kind of planning and safeguarding system in place, we have said there's there are people out there. Um, again, I can't um, highlight enough seeing other people who have uh, you know a kind of similar support needs to yourself doing it. Uh, but our experience has shown that there. So Matt's lived in his own home since 1996 and he's lived with people without disability that whole time. Different people uh, takes, sometimes it takes a while to find the right person um, and we use sort of similar uh, recruiting and training and safeguarding, you know, checking them out process Uh, that we do for paid workers and there have always been people who have stepped forward and who have shared shared Matthew's life with him. Now, those people don't do the same things that paid supporters do. They don't provide personal care, for example, um, but they share Matthew's home, they support him in other ways um, and that that system of... of, um, paid support and unpaid support, uh, a wider circle of support. These were all the pieces that we did work and thinking about and planning to do before he moved. Right. Yeah. And I'm, I'm glad you, you shared that um, piece uh, around it's been people um, that don't have, or maybe they don't have a notice, uh, a, a noticeable disability that have lived with, Matthew since he first got his own house and a a myth that's out there is that people with disabilities have to live with people other people that have a disability right um and Mm -hmm. uh I, I think it's important that you know your family has found a way to make that work for the last 20 something years right yeah um yeah so yeah it hasn't always been easy so it's 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 not a utopia but there's a difference when I see the kind of the fighting that my mum and dad used to do with the system when Matthew was living in institutional care so at the beginning of of our discussion Eric I talked about seeing, witnessing their powerlessness and the impacts of the lack of authority yes. that they, they had. So this is the, 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 and this is one of the lessons that I've taken with me through my career is that it's hard work. Um, so the, the social model of disability teaches us that it's going to be um, hard work. So. The hard work I saw when Matthew was in institutional settings was this trying to do something and having absolutely no authority to make a change. So the difference now is that there's lots of aspects which are, you know, hard work. As I said, sometimes it takes a while to find people to live with Matthew and you you feel down and you feel those feelings again like we're not going to find the next person. Um, and then when people do come, it's the same with paid support workers. People step forward. Then there's the all the issues of relationship and employment and the nuance of you know working with other people and it could be hard work. But when you have authority and control and decision making power, this is this is the difference. You can actually the hard work is about okay, well. We're the ones who can make a difference here. So, what are we going to do yeah, about it? It's, yeah, I like your point here around. It's going to be hard work, 
and what type of hard work do you want, right? So if you're if you're choosing the um, service um, disability model uh, or disability service model, then the hard work is going to be in the fighting the service to try and get what you want, the emotion of feeling helpless against that service or that organization um and then on the the um model where like with ndis where you're getting individualized funding where you have much more control over how to um implement that that funding in in solution um more of that social model which you were talking to is it's definitely hard work um but it's a different type of hard work right it's the rolling up your sleeves and designing the system and hiring the people and managing the people and developing the people and uh replacing the people when they leave and um so i like your point it's it's gonna be hard work either way there's no easy easy path there but there's different paths and um i think you and i are in the same boat that the one path is definitely better than the other because you have a lot more agency and control and you can access those good things in life um, much more easily when you go down the the social road. Yeah. Yeah. I Um, agree. So Mm -hmm. I'd I'd love maybe if we could either circle back on or, or tease out some of the maybe important experiences or or lessons that that you and your family and your brother Matthew have um have come across on your journey so a couple that that come to mind i mean you mentioned there was really learning from other families and those other families showing um us what's possible right those ones that that went before us and maybe we can dive into that uh, a little bit deeper. I, I guess I'm just curious for your family. How did that? How did that happen? Um, how did that? How did that come about? Was it um, a family group that that um, your family joined, or or what was that? Mm, well, um, so my, I guess it was really, but my uh, my mother's. My mother's position and role and her networks that, um, for my story, it was being int- introduced to those people and ideas and uh, they were people, they were people like Bruce Uditsky, Jeff Strully, Michael Kendrick. Um, there were l- lots of families and and. Uh, people with disability in Australia. So when I started my career, I worked in advocacy organisations and uh, I met a lot of people, a lot of uh, really great leaders through through that work. I guess I mention a couple of those people by name because there were particular moments in, in, uh, in interaction with them in those early when I was... In, um, when I was just at that sort of why stage um, that I have particular memories, that I have particular memories of. Um, so one, for example, was um, uh, uh, Jeff Strully coming to Australia and my mother had kind of helped organise a tour for him and I remember sitting, I think I was in the front row listening to his daughter's story and looking at pictures of her and thinking like, and she was off at the end of her um, schooling year. I think she'd gone off, we call it schoolies here. When you finish school, you go off somewhere for a big holiday with your friends and you drink a lot of alcohol and have a lot of parties and probably do lots of alcohol, but, yeah. Uh, She was uh, sort of, (laughs) yeah. And um, I was seeing pictures of her and just thinking like, why is this not happening for my brother, you know, like getting angry? I remember feeling angry. So there's 
those networks, uh, yeah, I have a have some distinct memories at that time of some particular people. So I guess I those when I think about those ideas, I really sort of feel like I was invited to, and I guess accepted a particular direction. So I feel that's important that families have a choice uh, here around what am I? I've witnessed. Uh, my son or daughter's experience or my brother's or sister's experience in life, what am I going to do about it? There's some choices to be made here. I feel that the, that the, the ideas, the direction that I was invited to, to, to follow to answer that question has been really helpful to Matthew and I think when I apply it, apply them more broadly in my work with other people. I, I really hope they've been useful to disabled people's rights movements and to, yeah, to the broader movement for inclusion. So the first one is like the, the old, the adage, nothing about us without us. This was a really important message that I heard uh, quite early on. When Matthew was a teenager, I remember us taking the active step of stopping speaking about him in the third person and uh, really consciously deciding that we were going to speak to him and with him. Again, even though we had no evidence that he would understand that, that was transformative for him and transformative for us, actually. Uh, in terms of his, um, what, what we found when we started to speak with Matthew is that he learned, uh, so his receptive language skills um, really grew. He, he, he showed, he learned, he learned language, he took it in, he, his, and then his ability to respond and show that he'd understood increased as well. Um, and over the years, we also learned that it was, um, like it reduced his frustration. I mean, goodness, when I think about all of the years now and he, he really hates other people standing with him right there, of course, and talking to somebody, so there's three of us standing there and I'm, you know, if I would be talking to the other person about him. Um, he hated it, so he then displayed lots of behaviours, of course, that showed, I hate you that know, too. what the hell are you guys doing? Um, so <laughs> I hate that too. And as a family, as a family, we did it and we decided to to change that. And I think that this is really, this, this was, uh, this story for me has kind of broad ed- application, you know, in terms of the the kind of key experiences or the key lessons of my experience is this, it's the same for disabled people's voices and advocacy movements and the place of families within that, working alongside people, advocating for investment in disabled people's voices and advocacy, self-advocacy and broader movements, echoing and supporting people themselves. This is a really important position mm-hmm. to, to be in. Thing that I was just going to add a, add a brief point, and then you can talk about the second thing that flows from that, relating to my experience with my sister Sarah. I don't exactly remember the point in time that we made this this very shift that that you're talking about. I think for some of my family members, it might still be a work in progress, but it's taken huge strides. Is my sister can communicate quite well, however. Others would look to either myself or maybe one of my parents or a support person that's with my sister for the answer, right? Because it might take my sister a couple of seconds to process her thought and then another couple of seconds to communicate or five seconds to get the first word out and people automatically just default to whoever else might be with her. And... um, and and it's just yeah. giving my sister the space to answer or you know just ignoring what that other person said and ignoring their look at at me <laughs> so that they direct their attention back to my sister to to give my sister um that opportunity and i think it's 
you know, I think from a values base for me, it comes down to respect, respect for Sarah or respect for any individual that they should be talked to, um, or they, you know, they should be included in that conversation, um, no matter their communication level, like you're describing with your brother. I mean, that dynamic would probably look a little bit different with my sister and I mm-hmm. talking to somebody else or your brother and you, Matthew, talking to, to somebody else. But the principle still holds. The principle still holds. And actually, it's a very uh, helpful uh, tool in recruitment. So when we're looking um, for people to come into Matthew's life in any role, one of the things we will look at is how people engage with Matthew when they first meet him. Now, some people um, dive in and uh, speak directly with Matthew from the word go. Sometimes that's not so natural and I, you know, we've come to understand that. So we might give people, um, if they start, they might, Greet Matthew, but then they might turn to us and start to ask questions. So we just that's okay. Um, it's a new experience for for lots of people. So we might say something like, "Oh, you know, we'll answer the question, and we'll say, you know, we've learned over time that Matthew can really, um, if you speak directly to Matthew, um, you know, typically we'll help answer, but it really helps Matthew, and we kind of explain why it's the right thing to do. Plus, it's really helpful to him. And then we watch: does the person take that on board or not um some people take that on board and even though you can see that they're feeling nervous and uncomfortable they go with it and some people don't and it's a really good Mm -hmm. it's a really good tool Mm -hmm. in recruitment yeah Yeah. right and then just from like a supporter perspective like just maybe asking the question like what what's the best way for me to communicate with sarah or what's the best way for me to communicate with Matthew, right? Yes. Like, give me the best, give me the best way. And, <laughs> yes. and, and but um, sorry, yeah. I interrupted your flow there. So you're going to mention yeah. a second, second. Yeah. One. yeah, that's okay. All right. Yeah. The, the, the next one I think is, um, and it's connected to this first one of nothing about us without us is the difference. So early on, I learned about the difference. So this was, I think, uh, working in advocacy as well, the difference between the interests of families and the rights and interests of a person with disability or individuals with disability. Um, and I think we've we've been talking a little bit about this, Eric. It's a theme through the conversation. So all the ways that families are not immune to being blocked um, by the same things that block society in general. So just because you're a family doesn't, I don't believe, makes you automatically, an, you know, an advocate for the rights and interests of of a of a, of a person with disability. So um, families are blocked by low expectations, um, by not having a sense of what's possible beyond their current experience. They're blocked by past negative experiences that make us really risk averse um, trying to work on you know we're we're trying to get things to work for ourselves our, and our lives so we can get on with our lives so we're often making choices uh, within very narrow perspectives so a, a really important lesson that's come from my experience is that I think it's really important that families commit to doing some work before and while they take on public advocacy roles. Um, and actually there's a difference between private advocacy, the private world in your family and what might work for you, and then stepping out into the public forum or public advocacy space and policy making and decision making um, there's a difference in that. And I remember my mo- mother always said, you know, when you're advocating for things, it's so important to think about the people that you, a person that, you know, who's living in an institution who you are never going to meet 
what you're saying may come to affect their lives. Um, so that you're saying this is this is really important for families. It's like being careful about what you ask for and what you create. Uh, so we we may want to create the things and the history of of um, the history of many of our schools and many of our services is families saying, um, you know, for example, it's not right that our sons and daughters don't have access to education. Uh, and then they go, they've gone and built the service or the school that's missing, the thing that's missing, they, they go and build it. But many families, so, so many of our services in our schools were started by, by families in their advocacy work, but I believe they've continued um, today to continue the kind of pattern of segregation of, of people with disability in our communities. Um, so, yeah, this is, was a really important lesson around what's the what's the place and the work that families need to do in in advocacy and what's the difference between advocating for our own interests and our own needs and advocating for the interest of somebody else, particularly for people who have really significant support needs. You know, unfortunately, my brother can't take a public advocacy role, the impact of his disability. Um, so, yeah, this this... There's always going to be somebody else, whether it's a person with disability in a public advocacy role or a family member who's going to be speaking for his interests. So there's just a heap of work that you've got to do around that. Um, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and I, I think it's really important for us to think about as families. And I, it's, you know, I guess the question is, how do you do that? Right. Or that because, because as in, in general society is educated in a certain way about disability, right. And we're educated in a way of, you know, segregation's okay. Making decisions for people with disabilities is okay. And like, so a whole laundry list of things. So how do you unlearn that? Well, you listen to conversations like the one we're having now, mm. or you connect with thought leaders, um, such as some of the ones that you've already mentioned, right? So, you know, the Michael Kendrick, the Janet Cleese, some of the others. You talk to other families who are maybe have, have these different perspectives and listen to their perspectives and maybe look at, look at their lives or the lives of their loved ones. And, and what, that, what does that look like? Right. Um, I'm not sure if there's any any other ways that 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 come to mind for you, Libby. But I think that those are some ways that the families can can start to to break through some of that, um, and and do some of that internal work. Yeah. Well, certainly. Uh, so I, uh, in the early part of my career, I worked for um, a family leadership development and advocacy organization. So, yeah, kind of getting connected with, uh, you know, if we're going to go out and talk about lack of access to education, what would be the thing that we, were, we would ask for? Um, well, inclusive in, in, inclusion. Um, so this is, this is another uh, lesson or, I mean, I, it's just in my bones that we need nothing less than full inclusion. So when you're taking on a public advocacy role, well, you're really asking uh, for, for nothing less than uh, what other citizens, you know, the rights and uh, expected for our, that can be possible for other citizens. Um, so we, we know, uh, I mean, there's just decades of, of research in education that says that the best way to unlearn stuff is to be sitting next to your fellow student to go through schooling, 
to be working with, to meet people in your community, to be in church with, uh, to be uh, in, you know, a volunteer with or to work with uh, a person with disability, that people are in our lives in ordinary ways. We meet them, we get to grow with them, we get to form relationships with them if we want. Um, This is the world, this is the world I've seen, this is the world that I believe is, 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 Mm -hmm. is right. Unlearning Unlearning can't happen if you don't, uh, you know, if you're sitting in a classroom and the only person with disability you ever get to meet is somebody who comes in and gives you a talk about the importance of, you know, understanding people with disabilities. You you, you know, you've got to be, you've got to grow up with, you've got Mm -hmm. to grow up with, yeah, you've got to belong with with, with everybody who's in your community. Yeah. So this is what we should be, this is what we should be saying is the right thing to do. I think another, you know, you mentioned there's a lot of research and there is, in my opinion, a great starting point to to dive into the research and some of the frameworks that have been developed as a result of that research would be social role valorization. So the, the work of Wolf Wolfensberger <laughs> um, is, uh, is a great, great uh, great starting point as well, or a point on the path. Um, Libby, I want to be uh, mindful because I, I definitely recognize we're in the midst of, uh, or middle of your work day, um, my evening, but um, mm. is there maybe one or two other key um, insights or lessons that, um, that you've kind of uh, come across on, on your journey that, that you'd be able to share with us? Well, I guess just in general, I mean, I, there were a, a, a couple of things that I think we um, we connected over when I when I met you in Toronto around the, a couple of ideas that I shared with other siblings that you you wanted to talk about um, in our conversation today. But I guess one just probably the one more general um, but very important lesson that I've learned is around. Uh, well, I, I call it like life is more than services. So, again, this sort of starts with our public advocacy position. Like it's, I, I really believe that it's wise to take a new, more nuanced approach than just asking for more services. In um, You know, these are the problems. Okay, what's the solution? We need more services. And I'm saying that, yes, even when I know that there's a great deal of un Met need and that that unmet need is often borne by mothers, the, uh, the unpaid effort of mothers especially. So we, my experience has taught me that a couple of things that around that is that life is not a service. So I know that people do better. There's three things. People do better when they have decision-making and influence over the things that matter to them. So having a service doesn't necessarily give you that decision-making and influence over the things which matter to you. So Amon, we need to think about when we're asking for um, more public support, what, what is the quality of that? What does it look like? How is it designed? Um, individualized, just individualizing funding doesn't give you, that's another thing I've learned, doesn't doesn't automatically give you decision making and authority. So this is something that we could really talk about is definitely in Matthew's life and in my experience with other people, combination of individualized funding and having authority is a key difference. And you can work, you can have that money yourself as a direct payment. Um, and and have control over the use of it, you could partner with a service. So I've lots of experience of, like, how can services partner with with people, partner with families and really be useful? So decision-making and influence is certainly something that we could be advocating for alongside of the right 
kind and level of resources. Mm. I know that people do better when they're surrounded and supported by people who love and care about them. Um, and I know that people do better when they belong. And so, this, again, this idea of inclusion, um, of being a citizen, of being part of your community. So being a client of a service for all your life is not belonging. So there's lots of things that we could be doing apart from asking for more funding for services that build belonging and build inclusion. So, yeah, I would say that that's a key, another key kind of general general lesson in my life. Yeah, I love I love that. Libby. Thank you for, for sharing. And um, I think a lot of those ideas have been, you know, maybe not shared as concisely as you just shared, but have been shared in principle along the way in conversations um, of other podcast guests that have come on the Empowering Ability podcast. And I think it's important to, to just to recognize that that what you just talked about, all of those um, principles are universal. It, it, it doesn't really matter where you live. And, and maybe you can share differently, but from, from my experience and the way that I've heard people talk about those principles from, from around the globe, those are pretty universal. It doesn't really matter where you are, um, you know, what province, what country, what state you're in. Those seem to be pretty universally um, applicable. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, maybe to to bring us home here, Libby, I would love to give you the opportunity to talk about the one idea, um, and it, there might be a story that goes along with it around um, the concept of creating win win wins. And I think your your um, your husband Sebastian uh, or your partner Sebastian ties into to that as well. Yeah, so I think this was a, a you heard me talk about this when I was in uh, Toronto with Janet recently, and I had the had the pleasure, the privilege of 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 running a workshop for for siblings. So I guess a theme through all of my of 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 my work with families and siblings included is. Um, the idea of, yeah, it's kind of like solidarity, empathy, but also challenge. We are powerful people. So when families, when family members have that aha moment, that shift, they can it can be transformative for the life of their family member and their own lives. So challenge. So this is another guess. Sorry, I'm going off on a bit of a tangent, but about being introduced to peer leaders, people who have gone before. This being introduced to change agents, people who are going to challenge you in some way, is also is also really important. So, just I guess the the um, one of the really important moments of my life, of course, was meeting and marrying. Um, my husband, Sebastian, and some really important uh, kind of gut-wrenching in some ways uh, changes happened for me as, as, a, as a result of that. One of the things that I learned uh, through marrying Sebastian is that uh, a sibling cannot be a parent. So he really challenged and taught me that uh, Well, to kind of open myself up a, a little bit here, I um, have really felt, and I think this is an experience for lots of siblings, I really felt very responsible for, for my brother and for caring for him, for being in, involved with him. And when you have a long, long-term partner or a partner or a man, Marriage, your primary relationship becomes them, has to be them. And if you have kids, your primary relationship is, you know, with your family, with your kids. And I had met Sebastian and married Sebastian, but I was really, uh, I guess, acting in a way like my primary relationship, 
was with my brother, which is really weird uh, to kind of say, but but that's um, how I would describe it. And I was introduced through him to the work of a guy called Bert. So I put some kind of thought and perspective around this through the introduction to a guy called a German psychotherapist called Bert Hellinger. And he developed this method uh, called family or systemic constellation. So basically it was a way of assisting people through, through body work and through role play of uncovering hidden dynamics going on um, in a system, you know, like in a family system from their perspective. And the goal was to uncover the hidden dynamics and to kind of free those blocks through look, seeing them, through developing a, a, an awareness of them and um, basically to kind of assist with re, reconnection and, you know, the loving relationships between people and families. What he says is that there's a uh, is that there's a natural order to a family that's unchanging. It's like who's first, who's second. So if you think of them, I always thought of it like paper, those paper doll cutout, line of paper cutout dolls. The parents are first in line and there's the firstborn sibling, the secondborn sibling and so on. When you do this family or system systemic constellation work you're asked to place your family um, you're asked to use other people or objects to make a picture a pattern of your family how you experience it and when I did that work I certainly and I don't think anybody would I certainly did not line my family up in a neat row my family members were all over the place and there when I looked at it it was re revelatory um, yeah it was a changing moment for me how I placed people in relation to each other. I discovered when I placed um, myself, I placed myself almost on top of my brother. We were, and my mother was there as well. The three of us were so tightly bound up um, and my husband was off to the side. And, uh, yeah, it was like, it was like, wow. So... From that experience, I did, I did lots more thinking and this kind of thought about this idea of like uh, this idea of, well, it's not my wording actually, a colleague of mine is wording this idea of triple win thinking of um, or win, win, win. Often we hear about win, win. Um, but she, and I just sort of lapped it up when she talked about it with me, it's really part of her work as a, as a coach and facilitator is let's think instead of win-win, let's think about the idea of win-win-win. And a triple win is like you and me and then all of us together. So her example is in work, for example, you're working for your own benefit, you're working um, for the benefit, particularly in nonprofit work, you're working for the benefit of a group of other people. Um, but then more broadly than that, the third win is like society, you know, how can the world win? Um, so whenever we're looking to contribute, it's like her idea is let's think of it as a, as, a, as a triple win. So this really made me think about with siblings is when we have a partner, when we get married, we start our own line of paper cutout dolls when we have or when we have a family of our own and our children. So that becomes the that must become our primary relationship. And then you can see in my own story the tension there. I struggled for a long time in seeing that or seeing so it's like how can my brother so this is where the triple win comes in how can my brother get his life and his needs met how can I have my life and my needs met this is such a big question amongst among siblings that I work with it always feels like I, I'm, I need to give up my life 
I can't have a life or my life is is one of care and support to my to my brother or sister but I really I don't think I'm living this life yet but I can see now that there has to be another way what is that other way the idea that Matthew can have his um, can have his life can be supported in his life that I have my life is so is so important yeah yeah for sure and uh, like just your thinking around this has definitely helped me with my thinking around my family and you know having me having my own vision for my life my sister having her own vision for her life my parents having their own vision for their life and then you know within there where's the common ground and how yeah and then, right and then that's right so what would it, it's kind of like what would it look like if everybody benefited that's the question that i'm asking if everybody who's sitting around this table one got what they wanted what would that look like now in saying that i part of that equation is that life is about when we're in relationships with others in life life is also about reciprocity and compromise so I don't believe that it's the right way to go to say, well, yeah, you have to engage in a process of, you know, understand what my full needs are, but then I'm in, I mean, this is in relationship with any everybody. You you you, you kind of can't get everything you want. That's not how life works. You're in relationship with somebody and you love them and that involves uh, whole range of things one of them being yeah this is reciprocal this is compromise this is yeah this is life so when I say what would it look like around the table if everybody won those two things are part of that the idea of of kind of compromise and, and reciprocity yeah but what are the what are the point what are the points where it would tip over what are the points there where I feel like yes it's this is now happening at my expense or at the expense of my relationship or expense of something that's really important to me Mm. um so it's kind of like generating an understanding of where those tipping points are Mm -hmm. this is like as I say I'm my family I don't think we've got there at all really but I know that this is a vision that I hold and I feel like this is is a pathway that holds open holds openings um yeah and really practically i mean my brother is married to a woman from slovenia so her parents live in slovenia i'm married to a canadian sebastian's parents um live in the muskokas and so practically it's like well when Tamara's parents are getting older and Sebastian's parents are getting older, um, like in my mind, I think, well, how's it going to look? Like if if they had to go over and live in Slovenia for a while and at the same time maybe we have to go and live in Canada and be in Canada for a while, what is the system that would enable that to happen? Mm-hmm. That's a that's a practical example of this kind of triple win thinking. Yeah. Um, yeah. To James and Tamara could be in Slovenia. Sebastian and I could be in Canada. Matthew could be here in Australia, and all of us uh, are getting our needs. You know, it's kind of working for all of us. What would we need to do or design so that that could happen? Yeah, yeah. Just a, yeah. a couple of of thoughts here to to wrap us up, Libby. Um, the I don't know if this. Let me know if this connects with you or um, resonates with you when you're talking about things that you feel um, where um, are coming at your expense, right? So um, where you feel that that's just like, you're not satisfied with that or that's too much um, for you. The way I think about that is that's where I start to set my boundaries, right? So like that's, that's something that I don't want in my life. And I'm, I'm maybe I'm not willing to accept that period or I'm only willing to accept that for a period of time. 
And that's where we need, that's like a design constraint, right? Like it's, we need to design around that. We need to design, and create something different. Um, does that connect with you in, in, in terms of maybe framing some, some boundaries for yourself or, or for your family around where you feel that it's coming at your expense? Uh, yes, I do. Um, but my kind of immediate thought following that, Eric, is that I know how, I do really know how hard that is to, to do. Um, and I must admit that, yeah, this spent a lot of time. I still can't get that right. <laughs> yeah. We've been experimenting. Um, yeah. 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 Um, and I do recognize that it's it's you know not not as easy it's really not as easy as it sounds right. and sometimes it can't find a way you want to put in a boundary there's, there's so many reasons why it's not possible sometimes mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah yeah but so but I believe it to be true still yeah yeah okay. that that is a way that is a helpful thing and it's a way forward yeah yeah um, the other thing I wanted to mention is I appreciate your your openness around sharing the piece around the family constellation work that that you've done. And that really connected with me as you described it with yourself, your mother, and Matthew standing all very close together or sandwiched together, and then other family members being more distant. And just a recognition of well, that's not what I want. That's not how I, I want it to be. I want it to be that primary relationship to be with Sebastian, you know, my partner. Um, but anyways, I could just really resonate with, with what you were saying in that family constellation of, of you know, for me, it being very similar with my mother, my sister, Sarah, and, and myself being very tight together and, and not, not really being natural. Um, when you look at No, that's not natural. Yeah, right. that that's weird. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> I've been working with many times, but you know, I wonder if that is a commonality amongst mm. families. Like, you know, are is are, is it an anomaly for for your family? Is it an anomaly for my family? Or is it actually a commonality amongst family that families that have a loved one with a disability in their family? Yeah. Well, I'm not sure, but and the. the I tell you, well, everybody, when I've done that family constellation work, I mean, you know, everybody in the room um, did, you know, created a constellation of their family and it was weird, you know, mm-hmm. everybody is like families are weird, right? Mm-hmm. So it's, um, but I think, yeah, I mean, we, uh, perhaps this is a, this is a, a plug for another conversation with you, <laughs> okay, uh, yeah. Eric, about the focusing more on on siblings. <laughs> yeah. But this is certainly, um, yeah, certainly in my in my connection with other siblings. Yeah, this yeah. is a common story. All sorts of weird things, you know. Fam- I mean, I met a I met a sister who literally had been willed. Her parents had never spoken to her about it. Then they died in reading the will. It was like, you will care for your brother. Mm-hmm. You, we are kind of giving him to you. Mm-hmm. Um, and no preparation, no, yeah, so all, all sorts of, yeah. Right. And I, other, I've met parents who say, you know, I've, I'm letting my, my other daughter go off and experience her, her 20s and her, her young life, but, you you know, when she reaches 35, that's it. She's going to kind of come back and, you know, help take care of a brother type stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And these, yeah. these are yeah. common. So, yes. Common. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah. Another very common thing, another very common thing is like uh, I often, lots of siblings come up to me after workshops and say like, why am I, like I've got five siblings, but I'm the only one in this workshop. Mm-hmm. Why am I the one who who like what is it? So there's there's also a common story about a sibling who seems to step forward or is given that role or a combination of stepping forward and given you know mm-hmm. there's other siblings in the family mm-hmm. but they don't seem to from the perspective of of that person they don't seem to do as much or 
step forward into the support or the caring system as there's uh, one sibling who who does it. Yes, yeah. yes. And from yeah. the yeah. Um, yeah. research or the maybe it was a secondary research that um, Helen Reese has done, uh, who's a co-founder of the Sibling Collaborative, found that that's most frequently um, a female and yes. the eldest female um, sibling. Maybe yeah, so, interesting. If, yeah, if that kind of exists in the family dynamics. So. Uh, yeah. But I'm definitely going to take you up on, a, on another conversation on on siblings. I really enjoyed our conversation today. I think it was rich with insights for for families and hopefully some tangible stuff that they can sink their teeth into or maybe it influenced them or inspired them, shifted them um, towards, you know, more of that social model and, and inclusion. So. Um, Libby, uh, one, I guess one final question for you. If, um, if folks listening want to reach out and, you know, connect with you or learn more about the things that, that you're working on, where would be the best place for them to do that? Yeah, a couple of places. So uh, my business is called In Charge, I-N-C-H-A-R-G-E. Uh, so you can Google that, incharge.net.au. My email address is just hello at incharge.net.au. Um, you can check me out on LinkedIn as well. There's lots of, um, of my recent work uh, on, on, on my LinkedIn page as well. Okay, wonderful. Appreciate that, Libby. And, um, yeah, again, super grateful for our conversation today and uh, looking forward to round two. Thank you so much, Eric. It's been great. Now, as we wrap up this podcast episode, I want to ask you one quick favor. I want to ask you to sign up and subscribe to the Empowering Ability podcast on your smartphone. So whether you have an Apple or an Android phone, you can do this. So if you have an Apple phone, it's just the podcast icon, the purple icon on your phone. Click on that and then type in empowering ability in the search empowering ability in the search and if you're on android any podcast app that you use it could be spotify or it could be podbean or it could be stitcher whatever podcast app you're using just go to your podcast app and type in empowering ability and hit subscribe and new episodes will go directly to your phone so this helps in terms of me getting you new episodes um, and it helps to grow the it helps to grow empowering abilities so if you could stop what you're doing and go to your podcast app type in empowering ability and hit subscribe that would be incredible and thank you so much for listening to the podcast today uh, if you like this episode and you think you know someone that would benefit please share it with them uh, be a part of the change to think differently about disability